Well, when we read the passage a few minutes ago, you see that a lot of it talks about Paul talking about sharing our faith. And, and uh, let me start with a question, if that's kind of, we see that as a theme. And the question is this. If you were to think of someone uh, who is what you'd think of as an evangelist, you know, what character traits would you think that that person would have? Uh, you know, I've asked people this over, over, over the years, and you know, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about, well, they're very confident, they're very knowledgeable, they're very outgoing, uh, but sometimes they get into traits that are maybe we don't always see as positively. You know, so not only they're outspoken, but they can be very persistent, they can be, they can be pushy, and, and a lot of times we have these very di different ideas. And, and I think one of the problems sometimes is when we think of evangelism and we associate it with these aggressive traits, what can happen is that we can hear the call to share our faith and we can say, well, well I'm not that kind of person and I'm not even sure that I want to be that kind of person. When I think of this, um, I remember back my last, my final two years in college, I went to a conservative Christian school uh, that, that had as one of their classes a class on evangelism. And, uh, and, you know, and when I thought about it, I, you know, it's a good idea in theory to teach students to share their faith, but the class was made up mainly of different teachers that would share their own approach to evangelism. And it was ultimately this very aggressive, outgoing, maybe pushy perspective. Um, I mean, you know, people would talk about how they would go up to strangers and witness to strangers and people on airplanes or, still, you know, uh, waitresses and, and things like that. You know, again, what most of us aren't that comfortable with. I mean, one guy was an example. He was telephone evangelism, and he, we came in and heard him listen to this phone call, and he called somebody up, and he's trying to witness, and, and you could just tell the person on the other line is trying to be nice and they're like, okay, what do I have to do to get you off the phone? Do I have to pray to receive Jesus? Okay, if that gets you off the phone, I'll do it. You know? and, and it was this pushy attitude that you could tell that uh, it's like, I don't want to do that. Or you had one guy talk about how he loved to use tracks, and he would you know, not only put tracks everywhere, he taught us how to roll them up so he could throw them out the window at hitchhikers and things like that. And, and it's kind of like, you know, I'm listening to this, and, and I tell you, as much as the, the idea was good, the class really turned me off to wanting to share my faith because I'm li listening to that and I'm thinking, I don't want to be like that. Not only am I not like that, I don't want to be like that. Now, with that question in mind, let me ask you another question. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to think of the person who was most instrumental in leading you to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And what character traits would describe that person? You know, what's interesting is when I ask people that question, they often come back and they talk about they're very loving and they're, they're, they're listening and they're patient. And, and, and what's amazing is that when you put these traits side by side, one is very outgoing and they're telling and they're persistent. And, and then you say, well, the person that led me to Christ, well, no, they were more defined by their, by their loving and their listening and their caring and their being there and their patience with me. And, and we have to ask, why is there such a big difference between the image of what we think of when we think of an evangelist and the person that God used to lead most of us to saving faith? And what is the right image? Again, if, if most of us are led to Christ more by the relational person, isn't that what evangelism is supposed to be? Now, in a couple minutes, we're going to come back to this question, and we're going to look at the, what the Bible says about what it means to share our faith and some of the pictures it gets but, but what I want to do this morning is to start right in the beginning of the passage we're looking at, uh, verse 2 of Ch Colossians chapter 4. And what we see is in the beginning of this, Paul gives us an example of prayer. He, he gives us the example in his own model of his own life. And, uh, and he calls us, you know, okay, this is what I do now, now you need to pray. Look at verse uh, uh, 2 of chapter 4. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, now, this is not just something that's a throw in here in Colossians. What you see is that if you look at all of Paul's letters, there's a consistent theme in all of his letters that he is committed to prayer, that he starts off the vast majority of his letters with prayers. And with many of the letters, he ends with prayers or calls to prayer. He calls us to pray. He urges us. He models his own dependency on prayer. And, and as we look at that and understand it in the context of this book that we're studying here in Colossians, I think one of the reasons that Paul was so dependent on prayer is because of what he's been teaching throughout the book of Colossians. If you've been with us any part of the study, you know that the primary theme of Colossians 
is the centrality and power of Jesus Christ. And how he is, you know, that Jesus Christ was central to Paul's thinking. The relationship with Jesus Christ was central to everything who he was. And it's not only that Paul thought a lot about Christ, it's what he thought about Christ that defined things. So let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. Look what he says in verse one, uh, 15 of Colossians 1. Speaking of Jesus, he said, He is the Im- image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And for by him all things were created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created uh, through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And here's what Paul is saying. Jesus is the center of everything. It's not only that we were created by him, but if you remember, we talked about this throughout Colossians 1 and 2, that we were created for him. So that everything that exists ultimately find their identity in him. And not only that, in Jesus, all things hold together. See, it's Jesus God, it's not only the source of all things. Sometimes people think, well, yeah, I was created by God. And we get this idea that he's almost like this, this you know, creator clockmaker, And he winds up the clock and then he lets it run. And he's sitting there watching us from a distance. And every once in a while, he has a little bit of involvement. He says, no, he not only created us, but he's holding all things together, that he's still intimately involved. And, and for things to work, for, not only for the universe to work, but for our lives to work. Ultimately, it's only going to work when we find our, our centrality of our life in a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, the problem is, is that we can get caught up into the world's thinking and we think about you know, what's going on in our life and, and we think that there's all these things that if life's going to work, then it's going to be this or it's going to be this or it's this because that's the world's message. And so we can think, well, if life's going to work, well, then it's going to be held together by my financial security or by the economy. It's going to be held together by my health and if my health falls apart, life falls apart. Or it's going to be fixed by government intervention and we need the right politician to be elected. Or a career, you know, is going to be held together by the right management techniques. And, and, and what Paul is saying here is that, no, Jesus and him alone, the whole world is held together. And it was because he believed this that Paul was so committed to prayer. His prayer was based upon an expression of his confidence in Jesus Christ. And so what he's saying is that we need to remember who Jesus is. We need to remember that he is the center of all things. We need to remember that we were created not only by him, but for him. And that if we have our, our, our lives centered on him, that's the only place that our lives are going to work. That's the only place that our culture is going to work. And if we remember that, we will express it through prayer. But on the other hand, if we're not praying, it's ultimately because our, our confidence, our practical confidence... Not our theology, our practically what we really, functional confidence, what we believe is in something other than Jesus. It's in our abilities, our gifts, our own efforts, it's our financial resources. And, and, and if we're, we're not praying, it's because we don't feel like we really need to be that dependent on him. That's why we don't pray, practically. See, and most of us would say we don't pray nearly enough. Why? Because we don't believe until we are in a crisis. I mean, I, I, I thought of a... Um, a story of, a, of three pastors that were meeting together in a, in a diner and they were talking about the theology of prayer and they got to the whole question of the you know, position of prayer and, and, and one pastor said, I think that the best position is when you pray and you put your hands together and your fingers are pointing towards God, reminding you of your dependency on God and another pastor said, no, the, the best way is to get on our knees and show our dependence and the third one says, no, it's not only on your knees, we should be face down before God showing our, you know, just our total surrender. And there's a, a guy sitting next to him. He's a lineman. And he says, says uh, you know, I can't, I, I can't help but overhear what you're saying, and I've got to disagree with you. I found the most powerful prayer I ever prayed was when I was dangling upside down from my heels on a telephone pole 40, 40 feet over the ground. And, uh, and you look at that and you say, when you're there, you pray, right? You pray diligently. Now, what happens? See, so many times we can go through life and we don't pray until we're suddenly dropped and we're hanging upside down. And then suddenly, God, help me, help me. Because suddenly now we realize our desperation, we, we realize our need. And Paul is saying it shouldn't just be in times of desperation. God wants us to be aware of that all the time because we see the centrality of Christ. And if we understand that, it, it helps us understand not only the importance of prayer, but the focus. 
Because if we go on and we look at, we see that Paul is not just calling us to prayer in general, but he's calling us to a, a focus of prayer. And uh, look what we see. You see, when we see this, it's calling us to, to focus on prayer, not just for the needs of the world, not just for our needs, but specifically his prayers focus on reaching the lost. If you have your Bibles open, verses three and four, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for us, uh, a, a door to us, a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ an account of which I am in prison, that I make it, make it clear, which is, why, uh, is how I ought to speak. And just in case we think, well, he's just praying for, saying pray for me to share my faith and because the people that share their faith are the apostles and the pastors and, and not everybody else. Well, then look what he says in verse five and six. No, it's, this is for you too. You pray this and do it. Verse five, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that you may, uh, may know how you ought to answer each person. And so he's saying, no, all of us, pray for me, pray for you. Now, why is it in the middle of this that he's saying, okay, now pray, but pray specifically for this? See, we can look at our world. All you have to do is you have to just look at the news the last couple weeks, and we've got a ton of things going on, and there are a ton of things we should be praying for. And we should pray for those things. We should pray for the violence that's going on and the, you know, the, the murders. We should pray for terrorism and the election and, and the economy. We should pray for those thi- things. But what you have to realize is that the most important thing that we need to pray for, I think what Paul is teaching here, is, under, is, is a, based on the most vital need of the culture. See, he says, pray for the spreading of the gospel because that's what the world needs. That's the greatest need of the world. So let's go back to Colossians chapter one. We saw just a minute ago. Let's go back and look at it again. Look what he says. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He's saying that we have been created to have Christ at the center of our lives. Again, we are not only created by him, we are created for him. And the only way that we can have our lives work is that when he's there, because he holds all things together. And if we don't have Christ at the center of our life, if Christ isn't at the center of even our culture, then what happens, if he's not holding together, it's going to fall apart. And so, you know, we can look at this and we can say, well, are there all these problems? Yes. But the problem is ultimately we were created for relationship with Christ, and if that's broken, everything else is going to be broken. But it is broken. It's broken by sin. See, because all of us have sinned individually, our culture is impacted by the effects of sin, but that's why Jesus came. So back to Colossians 1, look at what he says in verse 20. And through him, he came, this is why he came, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace by the blood of his cross. And our world has a huge number of problems. And, and I don't want to downplay the significance of political problems, of law enforcement problems, of terrorism and economy. And all those are significant. And we should be involved in all of those. Um, you know, we've got a mission trip and they're being involved in meeting practical problems. But they're also sharing the gospel. Because all of our problems are ultimately rooted in a spiritual problem. Everything goes back to the fact that we were created by God and for him, and he holds all things together, and if we don't have him at the center, it's never gonna work. Our culture's greatest need is not political. It's not that the right person or party is gonna win. It's not judicial, that the right court system, it's not economic, it's, our ultimate need is the gospel. Our ultimate need is to recognize that we are created by God and for God, and when we have him at the center there, then, then everything's gonna change. And you say, well, well, how does sharing my faith change this? Well, here's what happens. Is that if God comes in the gospel, God meets us in the gospel, and as he changes a person one heart at a time, as people's hearts are changed, the culture in time will change. And as the culture changes, the the laws are going to change. Everything else is going to change. So as we pray for ourselves, as we pray for our friends and family, as we pray for all these things, we realize, yeah, pray for the practical needs. Pray for those things, but never Get off the focus of the primary thing because everything else is just a symptom. Should we treat the symptoms? Yes, but they're just symptoms of the problem and we've got to realize and remember that ultimately we are the only ones that have the cure for the root problem. 
And if you're here today and we're gonna, you're going to talk about sharing our faith, and, and if you're not a believer, you're going to be like, why are they doing this? I want you to realize, here's why we talk about this, because we believe that what we've just seen sitting here in the Bible is true, that we are created by Christ and for Christ, and you have all kinds of problems, and you want to solve all those problems, and you're going to say, well, you know, give me something practical. So I can give you a lot of practical ideas. We have, in the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at marriage and family and work and all practical things. But apart from a relationship with Christ, all you're going to do is treat the symptoms. And so we have to say the most important thing is to tell you about the, the root cure for the, for the root cause. Now, now, go if you're here, I'm going to speak, and you're not a believer, I'm going to tell you most of what we're going to say today is to believers. And we're going to say, here's, here's how we share our faith but I want you to know why we're doing that. And I want you to realize that God is giving you an invitation to relationship with him as well. And that's the only thing that's gonna ultimately gonna deal with the core issues of your heart. So now for believers, when we look at this, what we say now, how do we share our faith? And what's amazing is when we look at Paul's prayer, what we realize is that Paul doesn't start by saying, now pray for unbelievers and pray that God would change them. He starts by saying, okay, now pray, but pray that God would change us. That the, that the beginning of knowing what it means to share our faith is praying that God would, would change us. And so he starts here in Colossians 4 and he gives us five areas that we're gonna see that he says, God, change me in this. First of all, he says that we should pray expectantly. Look at what he says here in verse three. He says, Paul asks the Colossians to pray for him specifically that God may open a door for the word and that I may make it clear. Now, what's interesting is that, again, he's not just calling that I may do that, but then he says, and likewise for you, verse 5, that you would walk in wisdom, that you would see the doors that are open for you, and that you would make the best use of your time. It's exactly the same thing he prayed for himself. But what's interesting is he's not only praying that we would have this you know, broad sense of, God, give me an opportunity to share my faith. He says, make it clear and help me to be able to see that. See, it's possible that we can pray, God, help me to share my faith, pray for the lost, and, and we just you know, kind of send up this very generic prayer. But he calls us to make it specific and then to look for the opportunities. Look at again verse two. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful. When he calls us to be watchful in prayer, I think the idea is pray and then watch for it to be answered. You know, pray that God would open a door and then look for the opportunity, be expecting, because God, these are prayers that God wants to answer. He not only calls us that, uh, you know, that, that we should pray expectantly, but the, and it, then as we pray, that we should pray that God would give us the desire and opportunity to share our faith. Again, look at verse three. Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, uh, of Christ for which I am chained. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now, what's amazing here is that as Paul's saying this, he's saying, pray that I may have an open door. And as you remember this, you've got to remember where he's writing it from. In the beginning of the, the whole series, we talked about, you know, kind of an outline of this. And Paul is writing this letter from prison. He is currently sitting in prison, you know, in Rome, waiting trial. And in the middle of this, he says, I'm in prison. He's not saying, okay, pray for my release and pray that when I get released, then I'll have an opportunity but he says, while I'm here, I want you to pray first and foremost that wherever I'm at, in prison or outside of prison, that God would give me an opportunity that I would see it. He says, God, give me an open door right now, right where I'm at. Help me to see that. And that's amazing. Now, when I look at that and I hear Paul praying that prayer while he's in prison, it's convicting to me. Because it would be really you know, easy for me to say, well, at this stage in life, I'm not really interacting with that many unbelievers. I don't have the opportunity or I've got this problem or this limitation. And what we need to realize is that if Paul's sitting there while in prison saying, not get me out or God help me to see opportunities when I get out, but God help me to see opportunities in the open door that's here right now where I'm at. How could, how could we pray any differently? Let me plant an idea in you. I'm gonna come back to this at the very end. What would happen if you were to pray specifically, God, give me an opportunity to share my faith? And I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to come back to this at the end. But I want to challenge you to, to say, God, I am going to commit for two weeks to pray every day, God, give me an opportunity to share my faith. What do you think would happen if you did that? 
maybe we're afraid to pray it because we're afraid that God would answer it. The third thing Paul calls us to pray is to pray for courage. Because sometimes we're afraid because we don't have courage. Look what he says in verse 4. Pray that I might find an open door and then for, that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Basically, pray that the door is there and then I don't wimp out. Now for him, that open door is Roman soldiers that are coming into his prison. And so he's got plenty of reason to be a, very afraid. He's in prison for sharing his faith and now he wants to share his faith with, with the people that put him in prison. And he says, okay, pray that I don't pray that wimp out. Pray that I have the courage to be able to share my faith with the lost and that I don't confuse the message. I don't water it down. Now, you know what? I, I see this happening in our culture. I see it even with churches. There, there are churches out there that are saying, what we want to do is we want to be, we don't, we don't want to offend anyone. We want to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, that we connect with people. And, and as churches, you know, there's books out there that talk about different church growth ideas and, and, and basically it's, well, water it down so that you, you, you meet people where they're at. You know, this idea that, you know, it's really saying, well, what does a consumer want? And then you start with what they want. And so, well, we shouldn't preach expository. So we should all only felt need sermons and we shouldn't deal with the hard issues that might offend people. And, and some churches, you know, we even say, well, we don't use the word sin because that might be offensive. There, there's a, uh, a denomination that's redoing a, a hymnal and they're taking out every mention of blood because the blood of Jesus, blood is just, that's an offensive concept. And what's happening in churches? And if it's happening in churches and they're giving up, do you, yeah, you all, we all feel that pressure. And, and I pray, pray that I would continue to have the courage to speak the truth without compromise. And I'm gonna pray that you have the courage to speak the truth without compromise that you look for the opportunities. It's not that we try to go out there and offend people with what we say. No, we should try to be unoffensive. But on the other hand, we've got to speak the truth even at the risk that someone may not like it. Because we realize that ultimately, that's the ultimate need. If ultimately the problems that we have are only going to be fixed in a relationship with Christ, then, then we've got to risk offending someone by speaking that truth and with a hope and prayer that it would all ultimately lead them to the relationship with Christ. Fourth, he said, we need to pray for discernment, uh, to see the opportunity, we pray for courage, and then discernment, to see the opportunity as God puts it in front of us. Um, look at verse five and six, he continues his thought. He says, now as you, you know, as you pray for me, now pray for yourself also, and now act on that prayer. As you pray that God may open a door for me, as he says in verse three, likewise, I would pray that God would make you wise. You need to walk in wisdom, verse five, making the, most of, uh, making the best use of the time. You know, look at the opportunities that God has given you and look for those opportunities. Pray that God would help you to see them. Now, one of the things that we realize is that, is that these doors may not always be obvious. You know, it's not, if we don't pray for this, you may not see it. You know what I find? We're going to, again, we talked about this challenge. Pray that God would give you a chance to share your faith. I've prayed that. At times I pray that consistently, and at times I get away from it. You know what happens? When every time I pray for it consistently, something comes. I'm not out there look. I'm not out trying to make it happen. An opportunity comes. Somebody asks me something, and suddenly, you know, people are coming to me. And you know what I don't know? I really don't know this. I don't know if the opportunities are always there, and when I'm not praying, I don't see them or if God brings me opportunities that he's only bringing because I'm asking. I really don't know the answer to that. I just know that when I ask, they're there. And when I ask expectantly, I should look for that door and look for that opportunity. And it, it, it's, it's something that we've got to look for. And you know what? The fact is, is that all of us have people in our lives that need to hear the gospel. And all of us need to say, okay, now God, pray for them and, and help me to see that opportunity. And seldom is that going to be someone coming and saying, you know, well, tell me about Jesus. I need to hear the gospel. And you look like a Christian, you can tell me. Seldom is that going to happen. But what's going to happen is that as we look for, pray for wisdom and discernment, we're going to see them start talking about a different area of life. And we're going to say, well, here's a chance to take that and to, to bring it into a, 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 a discussion about our faith. See, what we need to realize is that if we pray, God will answer this prayer. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 16. In that, day you will ask, uh, in, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask in the Father, in my name, he will give to you. It's going to be your tendency not to ask. But I'm telling you, if you ask anything in my name, I'll give it to you. Until you have asked nothing 
In my name, ask and you receive that your joy may be full. Now, what does it mean to ask in the name of the Father? Now, you know, or, or the name, Father in my name. Now, you know, more than anything, what it means is that we ask in something that is consistent with the character of Christ. Now, do you think that it's consistent with the character of Christ that we would share the gospel? Yeah. And here's what it's saying. If you ask anything in my name, if you ask, you will receive. Now, I'm sure that asking, God, give me a chance to share my faith, is consistent with the name of Jesus Christ. So I am sure by experience and by, you know, by theology that if I ask this prayer, God will always answer that prayer but you have the courage to pray it. And then you have the courage to say, okay, God, help me to see the opportunity. And, and then when I see the opportunity, give me wisdom to know what to say. Give me op- the wisdom, and what does he say? You know, that we would not only be wise, but that we would give an answer to, uh, um, you know, to each person. In verse six, you know, give me the wisdom to know what to say. Now that doesn't mean that, okay, well, what I need to do is I need to hit him over the head with gospel, and if you're the fall laws, if, let me quote scripture, let me do this. No, you know, because what we have to realize is that part of the wisdom of knowing what to say means that, that you know, we meet people where they're at, at their spiritual need, at their, at their place of interest, at their place of curiosity. See, one of the things is that we've got to realize is that, there's, that for most people, there's a, a process of coming to faith. You know, almost think of it this way, that if you say that there's a process that, you know, negative 10 is someone who's total atheist, total hostile to God, you know, zero is someone who accepts Christ, you know, positive 10 is someone who's totally committed to Christ in their life. Now, the thing is that if you've got somebody that's a negative 10, you don't come and you say, well, let me give you the four laws. Are you ready to receive Christ today? They don't even believe in God. They don't even believe that there's a God. They, they're total atheists. They're hostile. And so what is it, that, what's the right thing to do to, with them? Let's build a relationship, love them, pray for them, look for opportunities. It might be just talking about how God's working in your life. And, and, but the thing is, is that when I interact with them, if I can move them from a negative 10 to a negative 9, that's what God wants me to do then. And there might be times that that person says, you know, you could tell that God says, okay, now's the time to bring the whole gospel. But for most people, it's, it's something that takes a while. We have to be willing to come and love people through the process. I mean, I, was, I remember, I've, I've seen so many people that God brought me, into my life where I've had a chance to do this. Uh, one guy was, was a, an atheist. I mean, he's very, you know, very much, I don't believe in God, was very closed. And, and I remember trying to build a relationship with him. And because I knew how closed he was, I knew that, that what I needed to do was just spend time with him, care about him. And you know what the extent of my spiritual discussion with him for the longest time was? Literally for over a year. We'd get together every couple months for lunch, and I'd ask him at the end of lunch, hey, hey, how can I pray for you? Now, he doesn't believe in prayer, so he'd tell me all this stuff that, you know, but, but it's hard for him to get mad at me for asking that. Now, you know what happened is when I start, started to say, how do you pray for you? Every once in a while, I'd come back the next time. I've been praying for this. How's it going? And over time, he started to share some real needs and real requests. And that was the extent of our spiritual discussion for over a year. You know, and then one day we're walking somewhere and he says, after lunch, and he says, Mike, you're not, like, you're not like most Christians I know. I said, how's that? He said, most Christians try to share their faith. I tell them I'm an atheist and not interested. They tell me I'm going to hell and they leave me there. <laughs> so now what we're told is, well, I need to share the right words. I need to, well, and if they're not interested, no. What we need to do is we need to love them and share. And it might just be, how can I pray for you? It might just look for the opportunities and then leave room for God to work. And realize that if I'm moving them from a negative 10 to a negative 9 to a negative 8, that's great. And ultimately, it's, it's, it's prayer because God will change the person. See, that's what we look at that when we say, how do we do this? It's also, how do we pray for the unbelieving friends? And, and the key thing when we pray for the unbelieving friends is we need to realize that it's God that does the miracle. So I'm out there and people might say, well, I need to share my faith and I don't know how to do it right and I don't know... Well, you're assuming that if you do it right, that you're going to convince the person. No, you know, you know, people say, well, I don't know how to share my faith. You know who the most effective evangelists are? They're brand new Christians who don't know anything and who probably get everything wrong, half the things wrong that they share. They just say, man, God changed my life and let me tell you. And, and you know what, if brand new Christians who don't know anything and some of us led other people to Christ when we were brand new and we're like, now I don't know enough. You know, God uses our faithfulness, but it's ultimately God that changes the heart. And that's one of the things we need to remember. God, change me so that I will go out and be faithful, but then God, you do the miracle. 
And help me to believe you to do the miracle and help me be patient and let you do the miracle. And get other people involved in the prayer. Sometimes that's what, you know, that, you know, you know what I've seen? We've been blessed to see the last couple weeks of prayer. We've seen multiple people come to Christ each of those weeks because we've had tons of people that have been praying and you know what, God worked in that. And everyone who was a part of that prayer, then we get to be a part of the answer. So share it with people. Get people involved in sharing, you know, and praying for you. And, and leave room for God to change. Now, then how do we practically how to share faith? Real quickly, a couple things. Practical guidelines for sharing our faith. Right here in verses five and six. It says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of your time. Um, let your speech always be gracious. The first idea, speak truth in a way full of grace. You know, so often, you know, Christians can, again, be like that one friend of mine. Well, you believe, well, if you're not, you're going to hell. You're going to, you know, here's your sin. When you talk to a lot of Christians, or non-Christians, what do you think of a Christian? And they're often going to say, well, they're condemning. They're going to tell us our sin. They're going to tell us, you know, all the things that are wrong. Is that the spirit of Jesus? Jesus spoke truth and grace. He never compromised on truth, but he always did it in a gracious way. Look what, what is described about Jesus in his ministry, John chapter 3. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't get this verse up here. Let me go ahead and read it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. For he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Jesus didn't come with a message of condemnation. He never compromised in speaking the truth. If he never said, well, sin was okay. But you know what? His main message wasn't sin. It was about grace. Because you know what? Most people, some people will argue and try to say, well, sin's okay. You've got to accept me. But most people deep down know that there's something broken in them. And our, our primary goal isn't to say, make you feel more and more guilty and you're, you're bad and we're good. Our primary goal is to say, you know what? We're all broken. I'm not looking down on anyone. I'm broken. I deserve hell before God as well. But God's message is a message of grace. It's a message to every one of us while we are alive that we can come and bring our brokenness and we can say, God, here's where I've fallen short. God, I surrender and I ask you to forgive me through Jesus Christ, and he does. It's a message of grace and forgiveness, not of condemnation. And not only that, when I share our faith, we've got to then also let it be seasoned with salt. Look at verse six. Let your speech be full of, be gracious, seasoned with salt. Now, I have to admit this. When I read this, it, it meant something different than I originally thought it meant. See, Paul uses an idiom that we use in our day. In our day, have you ever heard someone talk about, you know, they use salty language? Now, in our day, that means usually colorful cursing, you know, that's a negative. But in Paul's day, it meant still colorful. The idea was that salt adds its pungency and flavor. Seasoned with salt means to be witty, amusing, you know, clever. It, it, it means that evangelism isn't going out and just like, okay, well, tell me your four laws, do this. And again, so often we can feel the need to kind of push things, to force them. I used this video about a year or so ago, but I think it says it so well. It, it says this idea of what we often think evangelism is. And, and this, is, this is as dry and forced as you can get, and it's the total opposite of what Paul's calling us to. But, but I think you can relate to this, of what we sometimes fear that it would be. Floor? Oh, floor, excuse me. Oh, no. Floor seven. That's God's number. So that's why you're going there, or that's no. Nice? I um, just like it. Okay. The um, the the button there says uh, case of emergency. Like push that button. And then it brings the fire department. I too. It, if I have an emergency, I press a different button. Jesus. There is no Jesus button. Well, it's you don't you don't see it out, out here. It's um it's it's more of a it's a button I have on the inside. You wouldn't gross. No, no you. Um, those uh those those glasses work for you pretty good. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, they help you see. Yeah, I see better with them than without. Yeah, I I too. Once was was blind, but um, but now I see. I wasn't blind. I Wait. was just nearsighted in one eye. I just I can see now because I I was 
I was in darkness, but now I'm not. It's, it's not a glasses thing. Contacts. What? Spiritual contacts. I. Uh, do you um? Do you like talking to people in the elevator? It, is this? Well, you know, I. I love silence. Sure. Could I? Could I ask you a question? Do you? If. If you were to die tonight, do. You, do you know where you're going? Uh, four eight. No. It is hot in here. Oh, you think it's hot here? You do not want to go to hell. Hi, hey. brother. This isn't your floor. Blessings. I think we got this one. I forgot about the end, but you see that and you think, that's what we often think, we force it. That's not at all. He says, no, let it be salty. Let it be something that is engaging. And not only that, but when you look at the last, the end here, it says, let it be seasoned with salt that you may know how to answer each person. It's preparing so you may know how to have, hand, answer everyone. Now, this does not mean that you study and that you know every tough question and you know how to answer, talk about every issue of theology. You know what it's saying? It's saying that you know how to connect to everyone. That you know how to connect, you know how to be, you know how to speak the right word to them. And that means that you have a friendship and you know what issues that you have and you know how to connect to them and you know how to, you know what? That's just being ourselves. It's being relationship. It's, it's caring about people. It's praying that God would see the opportunity. It, it's the kind of thing all of us can do. The question is, are we willing to? See, let me just close with a personal challenge on, on this. Just really two, two ideas real quickly. Number one, something that we mentioned before. Are you willing to pray for two weeks? God, I pray for two weeks that you will give me an opportunity to share my faith. Pray that regularly for two weeks and, and share with me what happens. I think you will be surprised. Again, we looked at, at, at John chapter 3, 16. If you ask anything in my name, the Father will give it to you. That's in his name. You will be surprised how God opens up doors. But take up the challenge. Pray for two weeks. Something else we're just going to, I'm going to mention, we're going to come back to this in, in, a, in several weeks. Think about unbelieving friends. Think about people in your life. And make a commitment to pray regularly for them. Make a commitment to pray, God change me, and God help me to see the people in my life, and God, I pray that you would start to work on them. And again, we're going to share some of this in a couple weeks, but I don't know anybody that's ever said, I'm going to pray regularly for unbelieving friends and hasn't seen one of those people come to know Christ. Are you willing to take up the challenge?